I'm going to ask you to do something that you've probably not been asked to do before. Close your eyes and think of Nintendo Wii. What do you remember first? I'm guessing lots of you are thinking of motion controllers. Nintendo's flailing first attempt to drag sticks full of gyroscopes, accelerometers, and wrist straps that we should have really been wearing right into the mainstream. Maybe it's the face of a me. Those hauntingly cheery digital facsimiles that filled pretty much every game that was worth caring about on the Wii. For others, it'll just be Wii Sports and that first time you tried to get your old nan to play and then she put a Wii Wiimote through the TV. Again, you really should be wearing wrist straps. And other groups might be thinking of probably best game Game ever Super Mario Galaxy, or balance boards, or when the virtual console was actually good. But I bet for a great many of you, it'll be something completely non-visual. Maybe something like this. Or this. Maybe this. There's just something about music written for the Wii. It just sounds wrong. Not written badly, but like it doesn't belong on a regular old games console. PlayStation's always opted for sort of a detached, ambient cool. Strings or THX blares. Microsoft, on the other hand, has broadly avoided music altogether, swapping the original Xbox's bizarre industrial soundscapes for near total silence on its later consoles. And to my lasting displeasure, Nintendo has actually sort of copied Xbox's approach for its latest machines. But the Wii had the temerity to feel sort of approachable. And that music meant your console became a little portal to somewhere warmer and friendlier and way more interested in jazz than you would have expected. It's a design choice that I wouldn't say just sticks in the memory. I'd argue that it's the Wii's longest lasting legacy at this point. Motion controls, Miis, balance boards, all of those have been removed or diminished by Nintendo in its recent years. But take a quick look at YouTube, Twitter, or TikTok today, and I guarantee it won't be long before you find a track written for the Wii. Covers and memes featuring tracks written for the Wii are everywhere. Before writing this, I went on Twitter and asked if there was a universal favorite among my followers, and instead I got sent dozens of examples. Some cool, some funny, some just downright bizarre. <laughs> Music written for the Wii at this point has taken on a new life as a cultural touchstone and inspired people far beyond the confines of the tiny white wedge it was composed for in the first place. Which leads us to a fundamental question. Why? What is it about this bizarrely optimistic group of tracks that's inspired people so far after the console itself has disappeared? To help answer that question, I spoke to musicians and comedians who've been inspired by music written for the Wii and even gone on to make their own iconic work out of it. Using the Wii is something that we tried to put in the show as much as we could, but only because it was our life. It felt immediately special. I got that Wii for Christmas and you're playing Wii Tennis. It felt like you're going to care about this in in 10 years. The reason that that happened is because of the meme value to the Wii music. It's one of the most utilized music of any kind, I would say. Music written for the Wii has a singular quality. Tracks written for it might differ in instrumentation or style, but there's a feeling that ties it all together. From the console's individual menu channels to the many, many songs written for pack in title Wii Sports, you get this odd sense that even if you hadn't heard it before, you'd know if you were listening to a track written for the Wii. And that's probably largely down to the fact that one person composed all of it. Yoshi. <laughs> that's almost not a joke. Even if you'd somehow avoided all of the music written for Wii, if you're watching this video, you've probably heard the work of Kazumi Tataka. Link's Awakening, Luigi's Mansion, Animal Crossing, Tataka wrote all of those soundtracks. And yes, he was the voice of Yoshi. Yeah. After coming up under the tutelage of Koji, I composed the Super Mario Bros. theme Kondo, Tataka established himself as one of Nintendo's go-to composers, someone who could be trusted to add a little bit of unexpected magic to everything he touches. It's not a huge surprise then that it was Tataka who was given the job of giving the Wii its distinct musical identity. Tataka doesn't give an awful lot of interviews, so there's not really a record of how he felt about being asked to compose for a console 
rather than a game, but it must have been an odd experience. Where soundtracking games is about accentuating or illustrating an existing vibe, this was something very different. Suddenly, Tataka was composing to create avatars to, or look at the weather at, or go to the shops to. But rather than feeling anonymous or diffuse, the musical identity that Tataka stamped onto that console feels like it started leaking out into its games. Wii Sports is the most obvious example. It's a game that fits so well alongside that menu music that its music feels like a part of the Wii itself. And it's a whole musical identity that would eventually lead to Tataka being given a game director position on Wii Music. But I won't be talking about that game in particular in this video because A, it's about covering music rather than writing new music, and B, I can't think about this next image for too long without feeling frightened and alone. But Tataka's work in making these tracks feel so indelible ended up going beyond cementing an identity for the Wii. And many of these tracks have lived on far, far longer than the actual Wii channels or games ever did. YouTuber, jazz pianist, and well-bearded pop musicologist Charles Cornell has explained on his own channels the excellence of the Wii's many themes, so he seemed the perfect person to start off talking to about why they endure so much. And chiefly, it seems, it's all about repetition. I think that musically, one of the indications that the job was done so well is that you almost didn't even notice the music, at least at first. It was one of those things where it just became familiar via playing the game and, and just, just by nature of participating and constantly, you know, doing it over and over and over again. And all of a sudden you realize like, oh, I'm singing along every time I open this menu. It's no surprise then that two of the top five results on YouTube for the Me Channel theme are 10 hour loops. Key to the Me Channel, the Wii Shop theme, and many of the other Wii big hitters is that they somehow never wear out their welcome. And for Cornell, Tataka's trick seems to be that he's made something that will always sound the same, but feels like it was made differently to other video game music you might hear. I don't expect to see music written in the way that I encounter it in the jazz world regularly. I think that's one of the biggest things that stuck out to me compositionally was just seeing like, oh, this guy's writing this stuff how we approach a lot of tunes, either tunes that are already written that we play or writing your own tunes with like a jazz kind of style. Like it just has that vocabulary in the writing and the composition. And that was one of the things where it's like, whoa, dudes were literally putting this stuff into a video game. And it's like, you don't see that that often. This is just a tune. This is just a chart that somebody might bring to a session and just be like, oh man, uh, I've been working on this tune, you guys wanna play it? Like I could sit down with a trio, like with a drummer and a bass player, and we could play the tunes that are on the menu. But when you have sort of a working knowledge, you know, an ear training and an ability to kind of like hear musical form and understand like where music is going uh, harmonically, and you hear some of the stuff that's going on in that, in the soundtrack, you're like, really? You know, that at least that's the reaction I had. I was like, whoa, whoa, like that's kind of cool. This is like a two, five, one moving in whole steps, you know, that like different musical devices that that are, again, that are uncommon in this context that you're hearing and you're just kind of going, no kidding, like, like no shit. He wrote that for this. Okay, that's dope. But the secret sophistication behind the Wii's tracks doesn't just make them good, it makes them, well, funny, and this might be key to their enduring success. Put some Wii music on top of something else, and it gets funnier. Look, we'll do an experiment for you now, look at this. It's basically internet science at this point, and a legacy of remixes, video memes, and covers has only gone to prove that hypothesis. But what turns well-written jazz composition into the equivalent of comedy flavoring? Sprinkle it on something and you get a laugh. I think that where the comedy comes is, I don't think it's as much the composition as it is the instrumentation. The usage of specific synthesizers, the usage of these kind of goofier, sounds like you hear trumpets in the me uh, the the we shop theme 
you know, the ba -ba 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 like you hear brass, it's synthetic brass, it's synthesizers. And so like, that's very obvious. They weren't trying to create something that sounded real. Um, and I think that the goofiness of something that's not real really comes across and that's kind of one of the things that makes it feel funny. And that potent combo of nostalgia and possibly purposeful strangeness has led to innumerable comedy compositions that use tracks written for the Wii. To the point where I'm fairly sure there are kids who could hum the Wii Shop theme but never used the shop itself or even saw it. But that trend had to start somewhere and I think I know where. Update day for the Wii Shopping Channel. It's funny because normally they do it at midnight, but it's like 11, it's like 11.15. There's no simple way of working out who used the Wii's music as a comedy tool first, but I think I know who succeeded with it first. Most covers or memes you will have seen came when Wii was already in the rear view mirror for gaming as a whole, or even when it had stopped production altogether. But Update Day arrived in 2008 amid the tidal wave of Wii fever. So what we'll do is we'll write a theme song for the Wii Shopping Channel. Look, watch this, watch it, you, watch this, watch this. You can sing to the titles of the... Super Mario RPG. Super Mario 3. Matt Johnson and Jay McCarroll had started a web series, Nirvana the Band The Show, in 2006, which blended pop culture, lo-fi sketches, and deep cut gaming knowledge to make for low-key, occasionally surreal comedy. And they were also extremely into the Wii, and it led directly to the sketch in which Jay surprises and then infuriates Matt by improvising an entire song set to the Wii shopping channel music. And amazingly, it was almost as organic behind the scenes as the sketch makes it look. Harvest Moon. You write this song? Like puzzle Pokemon, Toe Jam and Earl in Panic on Funkotron. It was our lifestyle at the time. Like we had a, that we in full use. Like we were using it to send emails and it was part of that living room experience when we lived together and at that apartment. I remember vividly cutting together that update day video and needing to match all of Jay's takes of singing to the beat. This is maybe not gonna make a lot of sense for some people, but it was recorded just straight. Like, it's not like Jay had recorded the song beforehand, like what we should have done, and then he was lip syncing. It was also hard to do because we were writing it as we went, and the whole lyrics like were kind of a real spur of the moment sort of thing. We were right, scribbling them down on a paper, and Matt was holding them up for me like off screen. And I was trying to read them and sing them through. I was barely able to get them out because like I was singing it like seconds after we wrote it. You were also so drunk, which I know you don't <laughs> like being reminded. I don't of. know why you're saying that. You're, you're only remembering that because it was one of the, um, the few times that I was having a few drinks while we shot, which is normally we never partake. No, we were partying. It was it was great. It was a great night. It all happened in one night, basically. It's no surprise, really, that they honed in on the song's weird appeal so early. The pair loved video game music, building it into the show from the very beginning. And something about this particular song worked for them immediately. We really loved all those video games and really do love the Wii Shopping Channel. Like, we loved it. It was like- And we loved the music. We, we would have said it at the time, too. You know, we would have admitted. We probably talked about how amazing the music was. Oh yeah, of course. It's, it's, awesome. it's one of those pieces of music where you don't even get to be exposed to that level of sort of jazzy, complicated chords moving around in regular day thing. It's the same way that the only way people experience classical music now mostly is through movies. And mm -hmm. so it's nice that video games still have one foot in the door to just get, give your ears a taste of something really complex. It being used as a comedy premise is just easy because it's like this music is meant to signify nothing. This music is meant to just be like the, t the thing you listen to when you get onto an elevator or when you're in a shopping mall. And so people have tried to ironically spin it into being like, oh, it could be really funny if I put this music against anything. That may also be what's going on. The thing is, 
Update Day was never meant to stand out so much from the series. Johnson and McCarroll had always intended for this to feel like a show first, and it surprised them more than anybody else that this single sketch and the song it was built around became an internet phenomenon of its own. I don't really understand why people watch it over and over again. I mean, for us, it was just like another video adventure we did that was attached to our television show, our web series at the time. I remember one time we had a release concert and the whole audience sung it back to us and we were like, man, Zero X Donkey Kong Junior Man. At the time, we didn't even know what the word meme was, but we knew that there weren't a lot of internet series out there. Like that was sort of still a novel concept and one that almost came with its own inherent sense of like cheapness that no nobody really treated internet content like in a series way, the way we kind of said, okay, this is us, we're doing this thing online. But there was no way for us to be thinking along the lines of, ah, yes, we were first to market on on Wii Music. To this day, almost 15 years later, a Twitter account called Wii Shop Wednesday retweets the same sketch to 40,000 followers every week. Even after Nirvana the Band the Show became a fully-fledged TV series, this potentially obscure sketch is probably still the duo's most famous piece of work. Update Day didn't necessarily create the future of how Wii Music would be used by the internet, but it definitely predicted it. And it's an early marker of how these strange, quietly brilliant compositions would be copied, warped, and reused for years to come by an audience that finds them deeply funny and even touchingly nostalgic. The sheer number of ways they've been used since then is staggering, but in the last few years, they seem to have taken a step even beyond that. You know, people always ask me, hey Gabe, if there was a Wii Croquet included in Wii Sports, what would the soundtrack sound like? And then, so I wrote it. After more than a decade of comedy being created using music for the Wii, it's no surprise that at some point the trend would eat itself. Comedian Gabriel Gundaka didn't just use old Wii music, he wrote entirely new music based on those original compositions. The thing is, he never actually meant to do that in the first place. So the first one was, was actually just coincidental, you know. I had written a song that I really loved, and then the next day I went back and listened to it, and I was like, wait, this sounds like a Wii song. It sounds like a Wii Sports song. And so I just changed a few things about it and I decided to kind of um, make it into a bit. And then it wasn't until after that one that I was like, okay, um, this is kind of fun. Maybe I should try and make Wii songs. You remember how I spoke about that odd feeling that you could probably work out if a song was written for the Wii the first time you heard it? Gundaka, an accomplished musician himself, realized he could play off of that idea and began writing an entire series of unofficial Wii Sports tracks. Each one provided the soundtrack to a Wii Sport that never existed. Croquet, snorkeling, or chess in the park. All Gundaka needed to do was work out how Tataka would have written it in the first place. I mean, there are definitely rules. There are absolutely rules. There are, there are sounds that you had to use. You have to use accordion. You have to use this beautiful fake digital acoustic guitar. They're very consistent themselves, you know. The sounds they use in Animal Crossing and in Nintendogs and Wii Sports and then just some of the Wii music in general all comes kind of from the same sort of like sound banks or whatever that they've decided or just sort of like feel good, like we're not, you know, this isn't Zelda, you know, you're not wielding a sword, we're just having fun. So it's just using those sounds. And the accordion is definitely the main one. Every night I wake up in a cold sweat, haunted by all the people who have asked me, hey Gabe, if Wii snorkeling was included in Wii Sports, what would that soundtrack sound like? So I wrote it. Just like the real thing, Gundaka's Wii Sports songs ripple with an odd combination of goofiness and a gentle loveliness. But just as Charles Cornell told us earlier, oh, now we're setting up for a totally different game. <laughs> he was also aiming for some of Tataka's secret sophistication. I wonder how he approaches that music. It starts and ends with a pretty distinct matter. Like the beginning, everybody can hum it, and then the last thing, you know, you can hum it. And then in the middle, it goes, it goes all over the place. I feel like he writes that melody first, and then he just starts trying to find the chords that follow it. Bossa Nova is definitely the main, the main one, uh, and that genre in general is just, you know, it's, it's so all over the place. It's all about um, chord changes, 
over the same note. I'd say that was my main impetus, you know. And you, you know, you listen to my Wii songs and they're fun, and you, you're like, wow, that sounds like the Wii. But then you go back and you listen to the actual one, and they are, yeah, they are very special. The one that I always show people is is Wii Tennis Training. That's the one that blows my mind because you don't. Most people don't, unless you went into the training thing. You didn't hear that song. And that song, I mean, you show that to any musician, and they're just like, "What? What is going on?" The response to Gundaka's songs proved that he was hitting on the right feeling. With each successive new release, he was getting the same kinds of responses, people reacting well to the accuracy as well as the silliness. And once he'd written eight tracks, they were released as a full unofficial Wii Sports album, which kind of feels like the ultimate endpoint to the Wii soundtrack's legacy. They were now so much their own thing, so full in what they meant to be, that they were spawning their own creations. And Gundaka doesn't just see that happening with his own work, he's seeing it elsewhere in music as well. When somebody paired Hotline Bling with Wii Shop Channel, it was just so good. I was so happy when I, when I heard that. I was like, man, that is so nice. Sweetener by Ariana Grande. There's a few tracks on that album that Pharrell, whether or not he knows it, he's absolutely pulling from Wii sounds. And I feel like also Bossa Nova is on the rise right now. Um, and I think that has to do with the Wii music. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. You know, there's, there's no coincidence. If we're seeing Tataka's songwriting not just influencing self referential internet culture, but wider musical creativity, this is proof of its legacy, right? Where the Wii's other biggest innovations feel forgotten or improved on by others, its music is somehow stronger and more meaningful than ever. It might seem absurd to spend this long thinking and talking about music written for the Wii, probably because it is absurd to spend this long doing that. But just like the music itself, there's a hidden depth here. The fact that Tataka's music stands so alone this long after it was created in the industry it was created for doesn't just speak to the Wii's legacy, but Nintendo's. There's nothing about the compositions themselves that to me screams comedy. Um, to me, the compositions themselves simply scream somebody that knows how to write music really well. It's a total lack of cynicism, I think, both in the way that we view this music and in the way it was created. And what's weird is that it's like a commercial enterprise. You're sitting there buying old video games that you're only buying because you're feeling nostalgic over them. And that's the soundtrack of it. The Call of Duty music is trying to emulate exactly what the movies are sounding like at the time. And the PlayStation menu is doing this weird modern synth soundscape thing where you just kind of feel calm, but it, you don't attach to it. There's like a tradition to this music and it only exists uh, in Nintendo world. Culturally, it's very distinct, but everybody's exposed to it. The Wii's music at this point is pulling in two very different directions. For its fans, they might be using it for their own means, but it's also absolutely representative of Nintendo's own stubbornness in standing out from the crowd. Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto has famously repeatedly said that he's not influenced by other people's games because it would affect his own creations, and it feels like that philosophy was also taken on by Tataka. It made for a soundtrack that feels like it could only have been written for a Nintendo console. Even if you've never actually played the console, even if you've only ever seen it soundtracking children falling over, or covers being played entirely on bottles, or turned into that one bit of the Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg song, Tori every day, Tori every day. you kind of know who's behind it. In a way, it's not really that the music has outlived the Wii, it's more that this extraordinarily strange and nostalgic group of tracks is keeping the memory of this extraordinarily strange and nostalgic console alive. And that is a legacy. Turn that up. I love that grooving. What kind of music is that? Like a bossa nova beat? For more of what we've been making for IGN's 25th birthday, we've got two more videos for you to look at right here on the screen right now.